Good morning and welcome to this Automation Academy Mastering the Machine webinar for the 12th of August 2022. Today's topic was advanced PLC and HMI programming and in particular I covered my simulation software that I'm using at Automation NTH for the uh, advanced PLC programming classes. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I have a little preliminary stuff that I, uh, I kind of go through at the beginning. The purpose of this, I have a, a group called the Automation Academy, and it is a membership site. Uh, I've had it for almost uh, two years now. I think I started working on it in August of 2020, and uh, it was released in November of 2020. And people join and they pay for you know, a, a month at a time, or some, some people have been there for two years and they just consistently pay. And I've got a low end membership and a higher end membership. One just is downloads, lots and lots of documents, things like my books in PDF form. And then the videos uh, are training videos that I started developing a few years ago. And then I kind of, I'm not going to say I totally abandoned it, but I realized there's a lot of folks out there creating PLC classes uh, so I didn't want to just create another, you know, uh, basic PLC class. I leave that to some of the folks like Vlad Romanoff or Steve Gates or uh, Sean Tierney. They're well known and they, they produce uh, training videos uh, online. And so I have some of those too, but I don't market them separately. I just put them in this site. Uh, so that's kind of that's where the Automation Academy came from. What is mastering the machine itself? Um, so I, I created a document about eight years ago, uh, and this is kind of a picture of it. And it was a you know specification guide for machinery. People download it um, and and learn how big machine builders quote machinery and things like that, and how they build the specifications, price things, et cetera. Sort of an inside look, and it's evolved into uh, this Automation Academy program, which is more of a, a series on integration which is what some of the members really want me to cover rather than just PLC programming. I did put in red down here at the bottom, you can not only download this Mastering the Machine Guide, but there is another uh, download. It, it is called an opt-in incentive and you can just enter your email and I send it to you. It's called uh, PLC Structure and Tag Templates, which is about designing your own um, you know, PLC program. A lot of this is based on Alan Bradley, because that's probably, I don't know, 80% of what I work on. I, I do Siemens also, I do some back off, I do some home run, but Alan Bradley is 70 or 80% of the US market. So that's a big part of what I do. Um, so that's kind of what this thing's about. The Automation Academy itself, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have videos on there, I have a library on there. I have a community which is kind of in the process of being redone. Uh, the plugin caused some problems, so I'm redoing that. And then we have these Mastering the Machine webinars, which are roughly every two weeks. I did skip the last one. Uh, I ended up in the hospital. So I, I went to teach a class in Las Vegas, and uh, I, I got diverticulitis right before I went. They put me on antibiotics. I got back and ended up uh, overnight having to go to the emergency room. So that kind of canceled that week's uh, uh, Mastering the Machine webinar. Uh, so anyway, so this is the, the website where you can take a look at that and of course download uh, these documents if you're interested in that, right? The PLC structure and stuff. So I was mentioning uh, to Dan there in, in Tucson, who we've corresponded a little bit, that last week um, I had a class for Automation NTH. So Automation NTH is a big engineering company here in the Nashville area, and I do about two weeks a month for them. Uh, one week on site and one week can kind of be floating. A lot of what I do is develop material for them, but you can see a kind of a picture of their lab. So they have anywhere from three to four interns at any given time, and at the end of all their projects, uh, so they do, uh, you can see a conveyor back here, and you can see these little panels. They do projects to design their own little control panel um, and make it run with this little conveyor here. It's actually a kind of a tricky process. There's a, I'll show you a little close up of it. It looks like this. And what they do is they have to set these lugs down at the beginning of the conveyor. 
and they sense whether the uh, part is standing up or laying down, and then they have to reject it based on whether it was standing up or laying down. So it like simulates an inspection. That's the idea behind it. The tricky part is it's all timers basically, and you have to be able to put uh, multiple parts on the conveyor at once. And so if there are five parts, you have to let the good ones pass and you have to let the bad ones fail. What that involves is writing an auto sequence for a reject, right? An inspection and a reject. And they, then you have to run four or five of them concurrently, which is tricky, all separate timing, all that. So they, they do that with uh, RS Logics 500 first. They do it with the little micro logics. Then they move on to doing it with a 5000 and they use an HMI and they use Factory Talk ME, which is the, the project that I developed this in, right? I used Allen Bradley Control Logics and ME. Then we had this class, which is after they've finished all that, they've learned basic programming. They've also generally graduated from college and already know PLCs to some degree when they get here, but they do a four month internship. They work in the panel shop. Uh, do uh, at least uh, two or three weeks there. They do AutoCAD, right? They learn how to do electrical drawings and then they build their own systems. And then when they uh, you know, graduate from college after they're done with all these classes, they may get an offer from Automation NGH and most of them get hired, right? So they're all four-year uh, engineering folks and a lot of their job is to uh, write PLC programs. That's that's going to be a lot of what they do. And Automation NTH does a lot for life sciences. So life science companies are notorious. One, it's validated software. There's a lot of part tracking. There's a, They use Ignition as a front end, which is a SCADA type package. Um, so, But of course, during learning, they're doing things like with these touch screens, which is kind of what I'm going to show you today. It's what I've developed things in. So what I give them in the class is they're, they're already familiar with this little project. I give them a full simulation of this conveyor. Uh, and instead of using photo eyes, because that was a little awkward, I have a random number generator here that generates a percentage uh, for inspection, right? A fake inspection. And then you can enter in what is the criteria, how many should fail? So what I entered in here is 15%. Anything, it, it basically rolls the dice and anything under 15 is a failure, okay? Um, so that's why this NG is here, right? It's a no good part. And then it has to reject it, just like it does over here. That's the basic idea. And I give them that and I give them the program for it. And I introduce them to some of the tools that I use for simulation, which again, I've been developing these for really years. Um, the idea behind it is they have these tools like Factory IO. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but it's an imitation factory uh, software that you can run simulations on. The problem I've always found with it is all they have is um, material handling. They, they have conveyors, they have, I think, a shrink wrapper of some kind, but they don't have things like dial tables and servos and robots and uh, I think there's a robot maybe now, but they don't really allow you to build a machine to, you know, for simulation. So I kind of started doing this just basically with little boxes and indicators and things in Factory Talk ME. Uh, and that's kind of where this came from. Uh, here is an example of a pick and place, right? Which is one of the things I said they don't have uh, in, in the Factory IO uh, thing. So what I did here is created a little screen for a pick and place and it actually runs right you can place a part here this will reach down close the grippers pick the part up set it over here these are photo eyes and they tell whether the part's there and you'll see it move across the screen and then you can manually remove the part if you want to uh, then i elaborate on that let me see if no that's that's not the next screen then i elaborate on that give them a couple more stations i do not give them the pick and place so a lot of times I, I tell them, you can simulate anything you want to, you have five days. The intent uh, for the simulation is not so much to learn how to write simulated code, it is to learn part tracking, um, which is hard to do if you don't have something running 
they don't have real equipment. So the only thing they can really do is, um, is run a simulated part tracking. I'm gonna show you a little bit of what the uh, screens and things look like now. Uh, there's the PLC program. So I've got it running, right? I'm in run mode here. Hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, this is just a little bit of the code. And then I've got a factory talk view studio application running. Um, and I'm running it with an emulator. So one of the, oh, it looks like two. I have a, let me see if this runs. Okay, we have a communication problem. I hope it's not connected with uh, Zoom being on. Let me try another. Oh, I'm online. That should be okay. Try another download. It says I'm online. So we'll see if something's moving here. I uh, should have a simulated uh, free running timer up here somewhere. We'll make sure that's running because it does look like I've lost communications or something. That would be a bummer. Yeah, free running timers running. So it's not, uh, it's not the emulation that's not running, right? I see this thing just ticking along here. So what is the problem here? Yeah, that's one of the things about the emulator. It, it kind of doesn't tell you what the issue might be. Um, but I should be able to. Oh, I'm running now. Okay, now it's running. So one of the ways you can tell this is running, uh, this is kind of fun, but I animate a lot of different things on these screens. So if I turn the feeder on, come on now, there we go. It, it turns, looks like a bowl feeder running, right? So all that is, is some, uh, you know, an image just rotating here automatically, graphically. And actually you can see down here, the overall running of this system, you can see parts moving through the system. Uh, this is part of the, of the conveyor system that I mentioned before. You'll see a part uh, rejecting here. I'll turn it off. You'll see it continue to move on here. This is the pick and place. Maybe it's running. Let's see if you can see it. There we go. So it's coming along to pick the part up. All this is running in auto cycle. When you get done with these uh, motions, right, we'll see there, that automatically went to here and there's the part, right? So it's moving through the conveyor right now. Gotta run the simulation, there we go. It's already gone. So I got three parts in my empty bin. And that's the idea behind all this. I also allow them to track parts. So that, that is the main point of this is to, uh, I create this fake part. If you look at the indexer, I automatically feed it here with the bowl feeder. We'll run that too. So I put it here, uh, then the, uh, conveyor indexes, right? And there's a couple of gaps here where I didn't put a part in. It goes to a labeler, it goes to a dead station, it goes to a drill, it goes to a, another dead station, it goes to a deburr, deburring tool, the dead station, then a measurement. And again, with the measurement, I do artificial, uh, uh, you know, random number generation basically here. I built add-on instructions for a lot of these. Um, and that's kind of what I'm gonna dig into today. Uh, I let the students use the add-on instructions, but you can also deconstruct them and see how did, how did I build uh, this actuator, right? Which is this thing right here, the simulated actuator. How do you build that uh, in code inside of this box, right? For those of you who do things like Siemens, uh, add-on instructions are the same thing as function blocks. You are allowed to feed in uh, data and the code inside chugs it and it feeds it back out. That's, that's the idea behind function blocks and add-on instructions. What this one does is it has a bunch of times. That's what makes these things move along a path. And you enter all the times and then you... Um, you say, what is the thing that is going to make this move? And it's an output, right? It's a physical output. Uh, so the PLC program will fire the output. 
this thing will move in response to the output and then it will trigger fake sensors, uh, just like a real program. And what I do, again, for those who are familiar with uh, Alan Bradley, I alias these uh, fake inputs and outputs to simulation digital inputs and outputs. So the nice thing about this is if you run this code and then later you wanna put it in a real PLC, all you have to do is point these real world tags, right? Output tags, input tags to uh, real world physical inputs. That's all you do is remap all this. So it can run fake here in your imitation and then you can map it to the real world stuff. The point of that is testing your program before you actually deploy it. And uh, back when I was in the machine building business, um, I would get, for instance, uh, uh, mechanical specification three months or so before I would have the actual equipment. And then they'd be building the, the panel and they'd be building the machine and things like that. And I would have three months to create code, uh, create an a HMI, uh, sometimes three or four months. It depends on how big the machine is. And then finally it gets powered up, you download your program and you test it. And I was pretty good at, you know, uh, making it all work together. I would run factory talk ME and test the tags, but I never ran a simulated PLC. I just, I just simulated, made sure that the tags themselves turned on and off, right? Uh, the, the links worked right. But when it came to actually running the machine, I had to wait until I had a machine to actually run the code on. So this is sort of a, evolved into something that um, that I could I could test real code on. Now, would you do this in, as a real machine builder? Probably not. It takes too long. But if I needed what I told the students in this class, as I said, if you needed to do something like test part tracking, you could right build a little indexer like this, even if your application is not an indexer, right? Even if your application picks parts up and sets them in different places, you could still run them through all of these stations and do things like, um, let me see what, here's my part tracking record. Uh, if I simulate this, see, I can bring up any of my old parts. So this is the historical data. You can see it's on number 55. We just ran a few more. I'm going to enter, uh, you can't even see my little enter thing here, but I'm gonna enter uh, 27. So look at a different part. There it goes. It, uh, switch to the part that was uh, produced, you know, number 27. You can see here, what I did is in my fake serial number, which I, you know, represent a barcode, I put the date in it. So 5 August, that was the last day of the class. And then I made up some fake part names, uh, Nano, Pico, Micro, and Milli. <laughs> and I embed that in the name. And then I also use a counter. So you can see here, this is uh, 1,044. I, sp I started the counter at um, 1,000 uh, 1, even. Looking at the actual parts in process, which are here, right? These things, notice six was blank. Six has no part in it. If I go to seven, and you guys can't see my pop-up thing, it's popping up on a different screen. Uh, but now I get the, see, Millie, 1,081, 11 August 22, which was yesterday. So I ran this a little bit yesterday as I was developing new stuff. So this is a little, you know, this is the HMI end of it. There's not a lot different here than any other HMI, right? I pin it to real world tags, part tracking. All these, for instance, are connected to an array. PLC part records. This is number 13's presence, right? So I'm tracking presence here. That's what turns them, um, you know, green and gray when I'm running it. And then for the data itself, I can go historical or anything else. Go in here, look at this. And this is the past record. Let's see, probably animation. Yep, uh, not visibility. Actually, it's not animation. It's uh, This is an actual indicator. And this is HMI part view inspection number two. Okay, that's the name of that tag, right? So that's what turns it green. Um, 
So this is typical in part tracking, right? I would need to log some data about uh, a weight that was generated, right? Fake weight. This has not been weighed yet. It's only in station seven, which is before the measurement and the weighing, which is later. Uh, here, you can see that I had 262 grams and 70.69 millimeters, about three inches across. Again, all fake generation of data. Um, I'm going to go into the PLC program now a little bit. This, if you have any questions about this, this is just like any other HMI application, except it's a little busier than most, right? Normally on an HMI, I probably wouldn't have orange items. I wouldn't have necessarily red buttons. Um, a lot of people like to shy away from uh, bright colors on HMIs because if something's red, generally it means there's a problem, a fault or something. Now, I know if you're in the process control world, you may say red means that an object is on, but that's not the way most machine builders work, right? They like stuff if it's on to be green, which is kind of why I do this. All right, let's go into the PLC program a little bit, and I'm going to show you uh, some of the basics first. Uh, the basics would be like my system routine. I always tell people, even if I'm teaching a basic class, the first thing you should probably uh, create, because it's dirt simple, is a basic auto and manual latching bit, right? So that's th where does that come in on the simulation? Uh, if I push a button, right, the auto button, it latches into auto mode. If I push the manual button, it goes into manual mode unless I'm in auto cycle, right? If I'm in auto mode and not in auto cycle, I can flip to manual or maintenance mode. If I'm in uh, auto cycle, I want to finish my cycle, finish moving things. Like I wouldn't necessarily want to go into manual mode when my pick and place is in mid stroke. That would be probably bad because I'd be left there holding apart and then maybe somebody manually opens the grippers, which actually I don't allow them to do. So they won't drop the part, but they, but they might move it, right? If they were in manual mode, they could move the pick and place back. But yet in auto mode, I'm in a step of the sequence that says the next thing you want to do is go down and drop the part off. Well, now you're in the wrong position to do it. You got to write more code to get ahead. So I don't allow people to go uh, out of, into manual mode if you're in auto cycle. You have to do a cycle stop first. Um, cycle start permissive, a simple push button with a three second timer. All this works on the screen. Very simple stuff. Uh, this is kind of where I start if I'm teaching an advanced PLC programming class. I guide the student how to do this. And of course, these students at Automation NTH already know how to do this. They have real buttons on their little, um, you know, their little HMI uh, displays and things. And they start their system the same way. Three seconds. There's a buzzer. It goes beep, beep, beep while you're starting. Um, there is a cycle stop request. This is, again, a delayed thing. Uh, if you push the cycle stop button, but you are not uh, stopped yet, you'll wait till everything comes to a stop position and then you'll unlatch auto cycle. So this is a simple simulation of a kind of a simple machine. It's got some other system functions here. And like I said, I give them all of this. I give them the main program and all the main program does is run this, right? Which is the as I mentioned, the conveyor that they're already used to, right? This thing. So they've already done this in the real world. And then I give them this and it, it does some simple processing. It does not uh, run in auto mode because you have to place the part and you have to manually, uh, the, actually the part gets removed automatically. It falls into this bin or goes into this bin, just like this simulation does. So they have not at this point done anything in auto cycle. Uh, so I give them all that, all this code, it's very, very basic, runs the, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong thing here. It runs the auto sequence for, for the conveyor. Not much to it, a few steps, um, reject, it either rejects the part, you can see here it goes to uh, 20 and through 30, just extending the, uh, the cylinder goes back to 40 or it jumps immediately to 50 and does not reject the part. So again, uh, I think possibly the people watching here, hopefully you're already familiar a little bit with auto sequences. 
uh, and how sequencers work. This is not a true sequencer, like there is an instruction named sequencer. I do not use those. Those are drum sequencers and Alan Bradley, and they're not, honestly, to me, very useful. Um, they are advanced instructions, and you don't have a lot of control over your steps. Like uh, when I want to go from one step to the other, right? This is pretty easy stuff to, to uh, write. If you need more information about this, I did put my website on there. You can go to even my automation primer website and download how to write an auto sequence for free. The information is all there. It's also in my book, uh, which some people own this book. It is Advanced PLC Hardware and Programming. I think I, oh, there we go. Yeah. Kind of blurry. I've got the background suppression on on this computer. But anyway, all that information's in there and, and some of it's honestly there for free uh, on my website anyway, you can download it. But that's the way an auto sequence works, okay? So this is the actual running part of the machine, but then how do you simulate uh, running through this sequence, right? Well, most sequences uh, basically operate on actions within the machine. So for instance, uh, this sequence starts uh, you know, somehow here, right? Uh, reject part present. If I, if I get a part in the reject sequence and it's supposed to reject, that's the thing that kicks the cylinder forward. When it reaches end of stroke, it comes back. That I created an add-on instruction for, which again, for those of you who are into Siemens, an add-on is like a function block. And here is the code for that, if I can find it. Yeah, instructions, assets. Yeah, so they, another thing they've done in Allen Bradley is they rearrange these folders. And I was used to something that just had add-on instructions set out there. But these are the add-on instructions uh, that I have built. Uh, there's my random number generator. There is a simple toggle, which I developed during this last class. I just showed people how to do a toggling bit. And here is the simulator, uh, the actuator simulator. There is both an actuator simulator and then there's a conveyor simulator and they run a little bit differently. They do different things. Uh, the actuator simulator, um, I'll show you one here. I'll show you the layout of it and then I will go into the guts of it. So this is the simulated actuator. You give it a tag name. That tag type is of the data type of the part that you generated. So act sim, the data type is also act sim, right? So when you generate all of these tags in a function block or an add-on instruction, the tag that you put up here will contain all of this, right? This is just the place to hold the data for the timers. So the idea behind, let's, let's pick the x-axis because it's nice and long. The idea behind filling this out is I say it takes three seconds to extend my uh, X axis on my pick and place. I also take three seconds to retract my axis on my pick and place. This is the extended departure time. So this is connected to these sensors. How long does it take when I tell it to extend to actually leave the back box? Right, so the, the sensor's on because it's retracted and then how long will it be before when I extend it that it turns that sensor off? 200 milliseconds in this time. You can put any number you want to in here, right? Uh, when does the uh, actuator arrive at the extended sensor? About two tenths of a second before the end of stroke, just like a real cylinder. So the idea behind this is to mimic a real cylinder as closely as possible. The code inside of it, uh, there's a good bit there, right? And this took some testing. I'm actually on my first revision of it. Um, what this does, the extend timer, uh, takes whatever you put in the extend value and it moves it into the preset of the timer. This is something that you need to do in both Allen Bradley and Siemens. You need to preload the values into the timer. You can't just set them, right? So I can't, I can't go to this timer and put in as a preset directly uh, time extend. I'm not allowed to do that. So I had to preload it. That's basically this. So you can see here that it, when I get an extend command, it starts running that timer. 
it needs to be a retentive timer because if you turn the output off, right, and it is a, a double acting solenoid, you have no more air. So it'll stop in mid stroke, just like a real, real air cylinder would do, right, if I don't hold my solenoid on. Uh, this is kind of an interesting feature. This kind of connects to digital twin technology. The idea here is if I stop my actuator due to a fault, right? Now I can fake that somebody cut the air hose or somebody, you know, uh, the, the electrical part of it broke. My solenoid valve is not firing. And so I don't make end of stroke and I will create a fault. So this is something you would use again externally to disable the actuator, right? Be able to turn it off. Uh, and you have the same thing for retract. So I have the extend time, the return time. That's the heart of everything, right? That's the thing that moves and that you pick up the data values for and tell how long it takes to move from point to point. Um, calculate arrival times. I like to comment this stuff. If somebody else wants to copy it, that's fine. I, I'm not trying to uh, you know, protect my stuff so much. I want people to use this. So I give it to the students, let them go through it, figure out how to manipulate it. And if they wanted to modify this add-on instruction, I don't protect it so that they can't do that. They can copy it and make their own version of it if they want to. Uh, extend sensor, I turn the sensor on when I reach a certain point, right? If I'm extending, uh, this became necessary later. It's a little hard to explain why, but it, the code did not work without this little um, extend sensor already here and less than. This had to do with the retracting of the axis. So there's the extend, there's the return. This is very interesting. This is the heart of what makes the object move on the simulation screen. Uh, what I do here is I take whatever the value is for uh, the timer, and I divide it by the preset and calculate, this is called normalizing, right? I normalize it here and then I calculate a percentage. So all, all actuators, if I put three seconds in there, the positions are 0% to 100% of stroke. And that's how I calculate that, right? And coming back, it's basically the same thing. When I get a return, I calculate the return position. So the origin, whatever the home position is, is zero. The extend position is 100. Uh, and that's what moves the object back and forth on the screen. And then there's a little bit of moving of the extend or retracted position into the current position, which shows up. Uh, where's SIM? There it is. Shows up here, right? So SIM position, if I'm running, this will change. You'll see it go from zero to 100%. When you retract it, you'll see it go from 100 to zero. Now, how does that link back to here? I go to, for instance, the pick and place. I'm simulating right now. So it's at home. It's at, that's why it's at zero. But here's the animation part of it. I'm moving this object back and forth. So I animated this horizontal position. There we go. So this appeared off screen too. Uh, this tag is the tag inside of that add-on instruction. So I say at minimum, you just click it and you define the starting position that's here. You move the entire object to the extended position you want. This changes, right? You'll see this value change and then you just put a check mark there. And that takes care of the horizontal position of this stroke. These values, zero and 318 are in pixels. So this is a 640 by 480 application. So this is uh, zero relative to where I'm at right now. And this is 318 pixels to the right. Okay, so let's watch this run here. So I'm going to run it. Right, it's waiting for the next part. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, place a part here. I'm gonna do this manually this time. It's kind of fun. Um, so I'll go to my indexer, right, which is this, it's already running. I'm gonna place a part there. There it goes, it just index. 
and there's my pick and place. That was the part that came off the end of the conveyor. So this is 318, right? And then the vertical, and it weighed it, right? So that was another thing that happened there. I triggered an artificial weight. This uh, random number generator, I'll show you that in a minute because I'm kind of skipping around here, but does everybody understand those people, I have a few people watching here, uh, does everybody understand how these movements happen related to the, uh, the simulated position and that add-on instruction? Any questions about that? I know I kind of put a lot of information out there. I got a thumbs up from somebody cool. Um, so there's a lot to this, right? Uh, this uh, simulation took me a while. And when I first developed it, it worked pretty well the first time I did it. But one of the things that was happening is no matter what I did, I ended up with a one second movement. <laughs> so obviously my scaling wasn't working properly. The sensors all switched and everything was good, but I ended up, you know, it would move across the screen in one second. It wasn't slow and smooth or anything. So I had to get in there and doctor it. So one of the cool things about, uh, add-on instructions is, I'm going to show you something neat. When you develop them, um, they capture a lot of what you do here. So you can see my first major revision was one, my minor was one. So I started at 1.1 and then uh, refined one June, it was still 1.1. And then three August, which was the, let's see, uh, third day of the class that I taught, I went in and changed rung six and nine time extend sensor to time extend arrived that was the problem why it wasn't moving smoothly uh time retract sensor to time retract arrived and that was version 1.2 so the cool thing about add-on instructions is it it changes it checks everything it says the last time somebody changed it and then it creates a help file right so if somebody were to look into my add-on instruction they could see all my documentation, right? Available languages, you can do function block. You can do, of course, ladder. You can even do structured text. I know there's a lot of folks now talking about wanting to do structured text on everything. That's a whole different uh, conversation we can have. A lot of folks like structured text because they learned C in college or something like that. But I'm sorry, Alan Bradley's ladder logic. That's really mostly what it is. And that's what most of your maintenance guys like. And I feel like I can do darn near anything in ladder logic. I've been programming, you know, control logics pretty much since it came out. And I can do some pretty fancy stuff with it. Like I said, all this part tracking, this is normally stuff people would do in, uh, in structured text. And I choose to do it in ladder because that's my, I would call that's my native language, right? That's why I use ladder personally. But I understand the young people liking structured text. There are some very powerful things you can do with it. Um, I even own a, a good book on structured text and read through it. I'm still not convinced that I want to wholesale go to, uh, to structured text for everything, right? I still use this. But anyway, so these are, uh, these are the actuators. So for my pick and place, which I believe that's what I'm at here, I have an x-axis with a tag name PNPX. I have a z-axis, right? That's the going up and down, PNPZ, and PNP grip. So those are the three axes for the pick and place. And this code takes care of the movement of all three axes. And then, of course, making pretty screens is a whole different thing. Uh, the students asked me, for instance, they understood the movement, but they said, how do you close your grippers? The grippers close from two different sides, right? How do you do that? I'll show you a secret here. It's actually two sets of grippers. There's a picture of closed grippers and there's a picture of open grippers. And so all I did was put one over the other and change the visibility. I'm not moving the uh, position at all. I don't use the actuator for that, for the position. It generates a position, but that's not how it does it. See if I can get back to where I was at, undo, and it moves it right back where it's at. So this is a picture of a closed gripper and an open gripper. Show you how this works in manual mode. See, it says I'm in manual here, but I'm not because I'm not running the simulation. Here is, uh, we'll do a cycle stop. So now I'm at 
So I got a blinking light instead of a solid light. That's what I do for my uh, ready to run signal. Uh, so to open things and close things, if I wanna lower it, uh, Z-axis lower, it should, right? It's gonna move everything automatically. But what's happening is this sequence is interfering with this motion. And the nice thing about this is this would do this in real life too. If I had it programmed this way and had the ability to do manual cycle, I have to do something in this code to say if I'm not in uh, the manual cycle mode, do not use this because I'm holding the valve up when I shouldn't necessarily be. In auto mode, I would want to do that because I get air leaks, right? A little bit of air escapes from my solenoid valves and I want to hold it up to make sure that if it slips, sometimes I'll do stuff like say, well, only turn the output on if you're not already at the top. So if it does slip, you'll see it jump a little bit, right? Come off the sensor and you'll see it move. Uh, you shouldn't have air leaks in your system anyway, but things do drift. Uh, but that's my problem here. So just like the real world, this would be something I would want to catch. I would say uh, if I put this uh, manual cycle here, uh, manual cycle, we got to start that first. There's step one. There's step two. Yeah. Got to still raise this manually because my code doesn't work right. And step it. Step it. These are all things you would do in a real PLC program. You would be able to step through things, be able to individually activate things. Your buttons would change state as you operated, et cetera. Go back into, take it out a single step. This is a toggling push button, by the way. So I did two things in here for toggles. One in my main sequence, I wrote actual full-fledged toggle code, right? That's what this is. This is a toggling push button. If you toggle single step, see if we can see it while it toggles, you see it changing state there. Right. This is a this is about the quickest way I've ever found to make a single bit that will toggle things on and off. Pretty simple code. This is on my blog too. How to do this? Uh, it's still a lot of instructions. Right. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight instructions. But one of the things I did during the last class, I realized this is something I might want to use a lot. So I built an add-on instruction for it. Right. If I go in here. There's all the stuff for it. And then here's the logic. It looks just like the other one, right? Except I gave it some more capabilities here. You can also set the output unconditionally and you can reset it unconditionally. And I used it somewhere in here. Uh, I use the same toggle somewhere in my code. Um, the only other add-on I kind of wanted to show you is how do I generate a random number? Uh, people ask that a lot of times. There's nothing random in a PLC, um, right? Everything, even timers, they're not random. They run to a fixed time, and so they are repeating one way or another. But there is something that is random, and that is human beings. And so what I use for my random number generator is occurrences of actions. So for instance, um, I run a 359 millisecond timer to roll dice. I run a, uh, let's see here, I think a one second timer or a half second timer for, uh, for a percentage. I believe I used a half second timer here. That's what this looks like. So I preload 500 milliseconds on it then when my generate signal happens, then I do all the math to randomly grab a, the accumulated value of that timer, right? And then I do a little bit of number crunching and make it into 
zero to uh, minus 99, then add one to it, which gives me a percentage of one to 100. And the random part of that is when you're running this simulation, you have no idea when the part is going to land at the station. So I use within a half second, right? You have an even chance of landing anywhere in that half second. So when a part lands, it generates the number automatically. So this measure here, purely percentage, and then I multiply it by, I think it's between 70 and 72, and it generates a pass. If it's under 70 or over 72, it generates a fail. And I artificially run in the simulation the numbers that it takes to make that percentage of failures happen. I have that both here and on my scale. So this is my scale. I can weigh apart, see if it weighs. I do not, there we go, 244 grams. I do not need a part here to weigh, right? I probably should have done that, but again, this is just for training purposes. I'm teaching students how to do this, uh, but that's what this does. This generates a number, I forget what the numbers were, randomly between 240 and 260, that's what it is. So this one failed, right? This would actually have generated a fail. I probably need to put my pass fail here too. Uh, once again, back to my part checks, if I bring up any of my old uh, part records here, you will see whether they passed or failed. Uh, this failed in spec two. Not sure which number that is. Let's go with part number five. This failed the final inspection, which is the one on the conveyor. Uh, so that's that's a look at the simulation. Uh, we've almost been an hour here, hard to believe. Any questions about this? Would anybody like to see any of the code again or any of the different parts of this? Uh, does everybody kind of understand what I did in the simulation to make things move? Go ahead and run it again. I'll put it in auto cycle. We'll let it run in the background here while it's doing it. So auto cycle, just like a real machine, cycle start, beep, 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 don't have a buzzer on it. We're in auto cycle. I'm gonna start my bowl feeder and we will generate automatic parts and they're just gonna chug along here. Yeah, there it goes. It's taking off now. I think we're good. I think when I, when I had that uh, instruction in there, boy, I'm gonna pick another part up. Look at that. Things just chugging along. Yeah, there it goes. That was what it was. I had a not equal in there. And when I deleted the not equal, I think I accidentally fat fingered a normally closed of, of uh, the grippers or something in there. But anyway, you see the parts running, you see the parts clicking along here, everything's running back to normal. So we're back to normal stuff. Turn the feeder off, stops running. Any other, any questions? Uh, it'll pick that one up and process it too. Any questions from anybody? Uh, on kind of what I've done here. I see Evan here, Dante. Um, there's a lot to absorb. Uh, there's a lot of code um, running. Basically all of these systems, I've got this little fake bowl feeder. I've got an indexer, which is all this stuff, including part tracking. I've got a pick and place that takes from the indexer and sets onto the conveyor. And then I've got the conveyor that I started with for the students and everything runs pretty well in auto mode again with the emulator which sometimes turns red uh, that is not normal that is I think and uh, a communication thing I'm sitting here using wireless and streaming to you guys at the same time as trying to run uh, the simulation so it doesn't seem to like that although it seems to run uh, let it chug for a while there you go running. Bowl feeder puts another part in here. You'll see this run. Here it goes. Drills, deburs, inspects, and it gets to it. So it's just processing parts, just like a real machine would. So that is, uh, that's some pretty advanced material. If anybody uh, needs a piece of this, oh, the final part. So 
the point behind a lot of this, right, after doing my uh, kind of advertisement for this is that I am in the Automation Academy going to turn this into a course. Uh, and I'm going to go into great detail on all the separate sections of this. I've already done on some of my videos like the uh, auto cycle stuff, right? How to, how to do auto and manual mode and how to do a cycle start and cycle stop. So I won't re repeat that. I probably won't uh, repeat the basic uh, auto sequence stuff, but I will go into great detail on this and the HMI simulation of this particular application. Uh, one of the things that I think I can do with this is uh, make it run on things like TIA Portal and Beckoff, which uh, a lot of people do Siemens. I could do it in step seven, but it, you know, not a lot of people are using step seven and um, it's kind of an older platform. So I think I'll do it on TIA Portal. I'll have to check the simulation capability of the HMI. The simulators work great in Siemens. Uh, if anybody's ever run those, I use the HMI simulated and I use the, uh, the emulator just like I do in Allen Bradley for Siemens and it works awesome. So those of you who haven't used TIA Portal, uh, very powerful platform. I'm not sure of the animation capability. Um, one of the things I like about this Allen Bradley is I can change the individual speed of the screens. Oh, and I know what I've got here. This is a fun one. I'll go ahead and reset my fault. Uh, got to do a quick part unload here. See, I have a full bin. If you have 10 parts, that's a fault. So remove the part, reset fault, and we're back to running. Turn the feeder off so I don't get 10 more bad parts. Uh, but anyway, so the idea behind this is I am going to turn this into a course in the Automation Academy, which is this whole thing, right? What is this? Uh, you guys can check it out. I am going to turn this into a full course with videos and uh, documentation and the whole bit. I will also be putting things like uh, probably printouts of this add-on instruction for the silver members. Uh, so I have a gold membership and I have a silver membership. The gold membership gets access to all the videos. The silver is just downloads, but I actually have a hundred and some odd documents uh, right now in the Automation Academy, including my books. You can get every piece of the books uh, as PDFs. Um, and that's a lot cheaper than buying the books. I, I don't set the prices for the books, but they are, you know, uh, 300 and some pages a piece and they just cost a lot to print, I guess. So uh, the, it's kind of like the publisher. I'm, I'm actually the publisher. It's the printer that sort of sets the price. And then, then most, of your, uh, most of your bookstores get 55% off. That's the way that works. So if you buy a book on Amazon, uh, you know that the author is only getting 45% uh, of the list price the author and the publisher and the print costs all come out of the 45%. And then the bookstores mark it up. They have a lot of leeway to mark things up. So that's, that's how things are priced. In any case, I'm going to go ahead and kind of end the webinar here. Um, when is the next, there we go, next webinar, either August 22nd or September 2nd. I've been doing them, trying to do them every two weeks. But honestly, sometimes just get busy traveling a lot doing stuff. So uh, sometimes it slips to three weeks. This last time I got sick, so it took three or four weeks, I think, since the last one. But uh, and I don't know what the topic will be. So for those of you who somebody wants to guest on here, I've had a lot of guests and I just shoot the breeze with them for an hour or so. Uh, Phil Scruggs, some of those guys um, had Vlad Romanov and Dave Griffith on here. You may know them, Tim Wilburn. He's been on here. Uh, so I do that sometimes. And if anybody else wants to be a guest, uh, you know, show up and we'll just talk for, for an hour or so. And you can tell me about what you're up to. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, so thanks everybody for showing up. Greetings from Chile. Oh, cool. I got a chat. Greetings from Chile. I have your book. It's excellent. Great teacher. That's it. I appreciate that.
understand 60% of what you are doing. The other 40%, I believe I need more time to study your logic. Can't wait to have your new book. Well, that's nice. And then Evan looks like you said something too. I haven't talked to you in person. Oh, it says, uh, Evan, at lunch in cubicle room. The logics make sense. <laughs> yes, when you're at lunch, it's hard to talk. <laughs> People think, especially if you got those headphones on, right? Uh, people think you're talking to outer space or something. So, uh, cool. Um, anything else up? Dante, I see you around a lot on LinkedIn. I have never personally used Logic Simulate. Yes, um, I didn't like it when it first came out. It was not anywhere near as clean as it is now. Uh, there was a lot of configuration. It's very simple now. All you do is put a processor in one of the slots, make sure that the slot number matches your program and switch your uh, processor in the program to an emulator in that slot. And it will automatically, so if I had like a uh, L73 in there, it would replace it with a uh, SIM. Let me see what the part number is for the sim. Uh, but it allows you to just place the simulator in it. And then my hardware configuration says emulate 5570. And the, uh, the processor name needs to be, you know, same as you would normally do in a, in a regular project. I called mine sim one. And all the tags in my HMI are also pinned to sim one because this is not really meant to run on a permanent processor but the emulator is great because you don't have to have hardware and hardware Allen Bradley hardware is expensive the emulator is expensive too it's a probably 1500 bucks uh, and then you have to own the software and you have to own the ME to run all this too so um, one of the things I'm going to do is I think I'm going to try to meet with a guy from advanced HMI I don't know if you've ever heard of him but he has a um, he has a Visual Studio based application that runs HMI software and it's free. Uh, AdvancedHMI.com, definitely worth downloading, runs in Visual Studio. And then he sells little widgets like push buttons and indicators and gauges, things like that for like three bucks. And if you buy the three bucks, you get the whole pack and you can use them in as many times as you want to on as many applications as you want to. So very cheap platform. I think I had to rebuy it recently because I'd lost my old ones. It cost $22 for all the little widgets he sells, all little indicators and things like that. But what I'd like to do is get him to where uh, I can do the same emulation, right, with the touchscreen as I do in Emmy. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but I'm going to talk to him about it anyway because factory I.O., in my experience, has not been great. It's, it's very simple and mostly just does... Um, material handling stuff. Um, I have it, but I haven't really messed with it. I've been working on this stuff instead. Uh, but that's mostly it. And it says, have you heard of Logix Echo? It's a virtual PLC version of the 5580. Um, if it's a sim, if it's an emulator, that's one thing. If it's a true soft PLC, um, that's a different thing, right? That deals with regular IO. And if it's Alan Bradley, it's liable to be expensive. Uh, virtual PLC version of the 5580. 5580 being the um, L80 series of control logics. Yeah, that's expensive. Um, it's, yeah, the big boys, exactly. I, uh, I, uh, do a lot of work with Automation NTH, and they use safety processors, full-blown control logics, and I think they use L82s. Uh, I have not used the Echo virtual PLC. It's just going to be too expensive. So I have a love-hate relationship with Alan Bradley. Uh, they're they're too expensive. I don't like their licensing things. I'm kind of capped at version 30 in my personal software, and it's because I don't want to pay support contracts every year to upgrade to and i'm not going to use their their factory help that you know they haven't been able to help me with anything usually it's their software doesn't work right and that's what you're calling about so um you know i don't need their support contract but it's the only way to get the upgrades yeah um they have a monopoly over the u.s market because of automotive manufacturers no ends yes they do um, so i prefer 
Siemens as a company and their stuff's a little cheaper. And I'm starting to get into back off and I like it because it runs in Visual Studio. It's a little more, you know, you, it's not drag and drop, uh, which makes code development take longer. Um, but, but it's a good platform and the hardware is fairly cheap if you can get it. So I just tried to order stuff for a trainer and the lead time is 200 days uh, for Beckoff. That's insane. Uh, I, I'm not gonna order Beckoff parts in the hopes that they show up in 200 days. Um, but they said what they do is when they take your order, they put you in the queue for manufacturing in Germany. And uh, so I bought a used uh, EK 1100 today and I'm gonna build a little trainer out of that and the little cards that I already have. But um, those are kind of becoming my main, main three platforms. Alan Bradley, because I have to. Siemens, because it's the biggest in the world. Uh, it's not the biggest in the US, but it's the biggest in the world. And then Beckoff, because it's pretty flexible and runs in Visual Studio. So I like that. Um, I'm gonna probably do that path. Do old versions of Rockwell Studio 5000 work with newer controllers? No. Uh, the, the firmware must match exactly. So whatever version of software you have, you have to have the same firmware in the, in the PLC. So if you've got 33 firmware in the PLC, you have to use version 33 to program it. Um, if you have version 24 in the PLC, you have to have version 24 to program it. Now, when you buy the software, you get all the old versions, right? When you buy the software, you get all the old equivalent versions, every firmware, you can download them for that first year. And then once you go out of support, you can't download any newer versions. So that's kind of the way they do that. So I'm capped, like I said, at 30 or 31. I can't go beyond that, but I have all old versions of software. So if I, if I, I do stuff with uh, version 19 and version even 16, sometimes version 20, those are not even studio. They are, uh, control logics, different icon, um, little different interface, and they work with the L60 series and earlier 55, 60s. Uh, so the 70s, you need to have at least version 16, I believe. And then the 80s, you have to have like version 28. And then you must have the same firmware. You gotta flash your processor to whatever software you got. And the 80s, I think are the newest stuff. And it says also, Dante, be careful about upgrading the firmware on the PLC. If the customer you're selling to has a version older than the one you have, they aren't able to be able to connect. Yes, that is a nightmare. Do old versions of Rockwell, yeah. Do you pick the version out of the box, the first download? I would never pick, I will go as old as I can myself. Um, here's the problem that I've found. As I've added, and I'm up to version 33 on my automation NTH computer, it's a dog. It's super slow, takes a long time to open, and does nothing that version 24 didn't do. I kind of consider version 24 the peak because it did everything that all the newer stuff did, but the graphics were a little better. They were The letters were bigger. Um, you could drag from one tab to another. That was a huge plus, and it just didn't crash as much. I'm, I'm getting crashes on 32, 33. Um, one, because they haven't had time to put out a lot of patches and two, because it's heavy, heavy software. It's probably twice the size of 24. Um, not a fan of their software, their, their uh, software department. Uh, you know, Alan Bradley is the easiest to program. There's no doubt. Uh, and you can't really flash back to an older version without risks. Yes, you may brick the PLC. Absolutely true. Uh, so lots of problems. Alan Bradley's in it for the money. Uh, you know, they have, like you said, they have a monopoly um, and they know it and they're going to charge you whatever they charge you and they don't care uh, what you think about it. Um, you all, not only can't you flash to an older version, but it's really hard to convert a program to an older version. So if I wanted to go from, this is developed in 31 and I would like to have a version in 24, but I would have to uh, literally probably set the project up in 24 and copy all the code into it. I, I, there's not an easy way. You can import it as an L5K or L5X, but there are many, many steps to that because you have to change the, the actual text in the file back to the older processors. It's a kind of a nightmare. So I'm kind of, uh, for this emulation, I'm gonna do it in, uh, everything's in 31. I'm gonna try to keep it there. If I wanted to go to 33, I could. 
I, I can, uh, you know, just change the processor to a 33 and it'll work. But when you go back, it's hard. It's really hard to run with the emulator or whatever. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of capped there. Cool. Um, I think back off and BNR are best set up for the future. Yes, I agree. Uh, don't know a lot about BNR. Uh, data is becoming like oil, and the more data you can collect and control in the future, the better. Yeah, the cost is better. The license is open. Uh, the only thing is, it does take longer to create a back off project. Um, you know, the Allen Bradley drag and drop and import export, you can import and export into back off too. Um, I can use spreadsheets for that, but Allen Bradley is fast to develop in. Um, you know, the drag and drop and the uh, dragging of the branches and constructing rungs is just really fast. Um, you know, but but their communications is some of the worst. Their cost is ridiculous and their support contracts drive me nuts. So take what I say with a grain of salt. <laughs> oh man, you're a young whippersnapper. Evan. Yeah, I'm I'm a uh, 62. So <laughs> kind of getting old. Um I've been doing it for about 30 some years. I love it. It's a great field. Uh, awesome thing to do. Well, I'm going to cut out of here, guys. i uh, going to go head home and eat lunch. Uh, I post this on uh, YouTube at the end, and sometimes I'll even cut a little of our discussions out here and paste if there's something interesting we were talking about. But I really appreciate you guys showing up. Um, not, you know, I don't even have attendees for all the, uh, all the webinars, but you guys showed up, and hopefully you got something out of it. So we'll catch you all later.